I join you from uh, St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota, and I'm very sorry that I am not there in person. On the other hand, as we talk about technology, it seems somewhat appropriate that uh, I should be joining you technologically and over cyberspace. Hopefully the technology won't get too much in our way. It probably will, <laughs> but never mind. We'll do our best. Um, I want to begin with the Bible verse that you probably are already thinking about in terms of this conference. So when a lawyer once asked Jesus of Nazareth, what must I do to live? He replied, what is written in the law? And the lawyer replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Do this, and you will live. Now, this Bible verse raises some very interesting questions. First of all, we have to ask, and the three questions that I'm going to ask with you are, what is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Is artificial intelligence a new neighbor for us? And then we are told to love our neighbor as ourself. Can we love artificial intelligence and can it love us? And if we decide that it is not a neighbor, then in what way is AI changing our neighborhood? So we're going to look at these three questions. AI seems in many ways like it's a new neighbor, right? I mean, we've got Siri, we've got Alexa, we talk to Alexa. Um, kids definitely talk to Alexa as if uh, she, it were another human being. We've got robots like Pepper down there at the bottom who are engaged in childcare, in elder care, uh, even are engaged in doing religious rituals in Japan. And then we've got uh, robots like Sophia, uh, who has been made a citizen of Saudi Arabia. So it seems like we have a whole new set of artificially intelligent neighbors. And they range everywhere from the box that Alexa sits in to Sophia, who looks very human-like. Um, really, of course, we recognize that these artificial intelligences are a lot of code. That is what they really are. And so in this talk, I want us to see not what we want to see in artificial intelligence, but to see what is already there. Now, before we look in some depth at artificial intelligence, I also want to ask the question, who are we? And from a Christian perspective, the same uh, Genesis tells us that we are created in the image of God. And at the same time, we are also trying to create computer technology, artificial intelligence in our own image. So one of the questions we might ask is, are these images the same? Is the image that we are giving to artificial intelligence also the image that we happen to share with God. So I want to take first a quick look at what it means to be in God's image. And this has been understood in a variety of ways by theologians down through the years. Um, some have said, well, we share our intelligence, our mind. But if we look at the Genesis text where it says we're in the image of God, not much is said about intelligence. Instead, a lot is said about action. So this brings me to the idea. If we look here, you'll see that, um, you know, we are given dominion over all the other things that were created before us. That we are created in God's image and created more than one of us and in more than one way, male and female. Let's look at the dominion part first. If we focus on that, we can think of the image as being a function. To be is to do. 
Do we image God in what we do on earth? And this was held by biblical exegetes in the 20th century and moving into the 21st century as fitting very well with the text of the Genesis uh, verse that puts our being in God's image right next to our having dominion over the earth. So the biblical scholar Gerhard von Rad writes, just as powerful earthly kings to indicate their claim to dominion erect an image of themselves in the provinces of their empire where they do not personally appear, so man is placed upon earth in God's image as God's sovereign emblem. He's really only God's representative, summoned to maintain and enforce God's claim to dominion over the earth. So this is the first way we can think about our imaging God. Now, if we think about how we might be transferring that to the computer, we can take a look at the fact that we've had tools that extend our function or function for us for an awfully long time. So all these other machines we've done, and most of them have done things a little bit better than we could. Um, of course, we're rather worried now about will the computer start doing things better? So far, we've never worried about our machines doing things faster, better, stronger than we do. Um, but we do worry about the computer. If we're only what we do, does this mean that as the computer takes over more and more of our jobs, we will do less and less? Does it take away from us? Well, I'd like to say that this is an incomplete view of what it is for us to be in the image of God. And we know that if we just look at the range of human beings, is a little baby who can't do very much yet less in the image of God? Or is an elderly person as they reach the end of their life and they're no longer in that productive stage, less the image of God? We would resoundingly say no. So we have to say just what we do is not enough. That is not enough for us to be in the image of God. And actually, that's a very good thing because often what we do doesn't come out the way we expect it to. So we need more than that. And here I want to turn to the theologian Karl Barth. And he says, in God's own being, there's a counterpart, you know, a, a genuine, um, excuse me, I can't actually read this whole thing on my screen. Uh, a genuine, some sort of self-encounter and self-discovery. And now my phone is ringing. <laughs> well, I told you technology was going to get in our way. <laughs> we'll have a little serenade here for a moment. Anyway, you can read this. And humans are the repetition of this divine form of life. Okay, so what he's talking about here isn't function. It's something different. and. It's really image as relationship. I am because you are. Bart goes further to say that as Christians, we believe in a triune God. And the image of the Trinity is found in relationship. In other words, God is a relationship. The relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. And so we express our image of God only corporately. No one of us alone can image God all by ourselves. We image God when we are in relationship. And Bart goes back to the Genesis verse and says, after we get past all the stewardship stuff, we get to, so in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And he says, okay, there's the them part. He doesn't just create one person, he creates all of us. And he creates men and women to be in relationship. And finally, he says, let's take a look at Jesus as the norm. And he says, when we see Jesus, we do not see him alone. 
we always see him surrounded by others, surrounded by his disciples, surrounded by the crowds. Jesus is the man for others. So he says, we are best imaging God when we are in relationship with others. It is in this relationship that the image of a triune God, a God that is relationship, shows up. And in a way, we see this in our science fiction. When we look at artificial intelligence as we dream about it, as we posit it in the future, sometimes maybe the very near future is in the movie Her, sometimes more distant future, such as 2001, Ex Machina, we see that it's all about relationship. But the question is, this is science fiction. Is it real? Can we really be in relationship with computers as they currently are, not as we wish them to be in some distant future? So is it real if we have a relationship with a robot? The question that I have to ask is if we go back to the verse from Luke that I read at the beginning, what was it all about in relationship? It was about love. It said, you will love your neighbor as yourself. So we come to our second question. Can a computer love? Well, some are actually looking at computers as possible sexual partners, as possible companions. Now, clearly, I think there are still some real difficulties in this. If we look at... Uh, computer, uh, so let's say a robot, as a sexual partner, we have to think about the purpose of sex. And here I turn to Humanae Vitae from Pope Paul the Sixth, who says that sex is wholly within the context of a love that is freely given, based in trust, exclusive, and meant not only to survive the joys and sorrows of daily life, but also to grow so that husband and wife become in a way one heart and one soul and together attain their human fulfillment. Here we have a couple of stumbling blocks. Could we say that a robot's love is freely given if it's programmed to do that? And what does trust mean in a context where the machine can't do anything other than show loving behavior? And would a machine that does not grow old or sick or face death be able to share in our joys and sorrows of daily life? Well, this is a problem, I think, but let's just set sexual love aside for now and simply look at empathy or charity. So the psychologist Simon Baron Cohen says, empathy is our ability to identify what someone else is thinking and feeling and to respond with an appropriate emotion. So we see in here two things, recognition and response, and then a third thing in the middle, an appropriate emotion. Now, computers are getting somewhere with recognition and response. So we do have programs being developed that can recognize different emotional states in a person's voice. This could be helpful in a help center when they're recognized, when a person is getting agitated. Um, also, facial recognition of emotions is being worked on. These programs are nowhere near perfect. In fact, a great deal of bias tends to work into them. Um, we also have some response. You can see emotional uh, facial expressions in humanoid sorts of robots. You can see emotional Facial expressions, um, if we have an avatar on a screen. So you might say, well, okay, recognition and response, we're kind of there. But we need to think also about the appropriate emotion in the middle. Can a computer feel an emotion? Or does emotion really need for us to have a body? According to the psychologist Jerome Kagan, there are four stages to emotion perception of a stimulus, 
change in feeling that is physical, an appraisal, and then a response. Okay, the problem with a computer, it can perceive a stimulus. It can appraise that stimulus. It can respond to that stimulus. But number two is a little bit of an issue. Without a body, it's going to have difficulty having that change in feeling. Now, when you think about your own emotion, so I've got the mountain lion here. So suppose you're out uh, in the hills north of Pasadena taking a walk, you know, not today with all the fires, but uh, some other time, and you hear a rustling in the brush, okay? You get that perception of the stimulus, rustling in the brush. But your body is going to react long before your mind does. In other words, your heart rate is going to speed up. You're going to get that shot of adrenaline. Um, you're going to maybe get sweaty palms. Then your brain is going to kick in and say, rustling in the brush, is that a mountain lion? And you will make your response to that mountain lion. But the feeling comes first. The feeling of fear comes first. In other situations, when we feel love, we feel that sort of warmth and relaxation in our body. And it's often the feeling that we appraise along with the stimulus. Without that change in feeling, think for a minute about the computer, okay? It perceives a stimulus, it decides cognitively what is the appropriate response for the stimulus and it gives a response. There are people who are like this, who actually don't feel your pain, who don't feel an emotion physically, and we call them sociopaths. So in many ways, a computer, does it have emotion? Well, only in so far as a sociopath has emotion. It does one, three, and four, but it doesn't actually feel, okay? And I think we also notice that we need bodies even for our response. When we write to each other in cyberspace, you know, where would we be without, why do we have all these emojis? Precisely because we can't respond without something physical. So I think until our artificial intelligence has a body that is very, very much closer to our own human bodies, we are not going to be able to relate to them as we do to one another. They're not going to be a neighbor to us, not in the way that we can be neighbors to one another. So if it's not a new neighbor, what is AI? Again here, I want to focus in on not what we want it to be, but what it really is right now. And first and foremost, what AI really is right now is a military technology. Okay, the US uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, has allocated over $2 billion to AI research. And we are certainly not alone. China is doing the same thing. Russia is doing the same thing. These dollars are being spent to develop systems for cybersecurity, to detect uh, audio or video deep fakes, to do facial recognition, to run autonomous vehicles, and perhaps most frightening of all, to run autonomous weapons. I what I wanted to show you was um, a video showing how from a satellite, they can now zoom in so that satellites that are flying so high that we don't even know they're up there can zoom in and you know, pick out a license plate, pick out uh, a face. And even in testing, um, the ACLU is already worried that the government is storing a great deal of data about people, about who is going where, who is doing what, um, and we don't actually know about this data, but it's AI that is allowing that data to be sifted through, uh, to be correlated, and for useful information 
to come out of all of this data. We also have AI in terms of weapons, and these are just uh, a couple of weapons that are under development. Uh, here we have these sort of mechanical dogs uh, that can run on a battlefield. Mechanical tanks are being developed by both the United States and the Russians. Uh, we have a lot of AI being used, again, in facial recognition um, and in fingerprint recognition. So uh, there's our first of what AI really is for us right now. Now, on the domestic front, we also have AI. And uh, here I have, um, we're probably using it right now. When your video conference shifts the microphone to pick up a speaker's voice, when your smartphone automatically reroutes you around traffic, when your thermostat automatically lowers the air conditioning on a cool day, that's all AI in action. It gets code, it works behind the scenes. These are all great things that are making our world a better place. That's the upside. Now the downside on the bottom. Facebook uses AI programs to decide what content you will see, which of your many friends posts and what advertisements will appear in your news feeds. It also uses AI to identify pornography, hate speech, and fake accounts. Now that all sounds pretty good, um, but we also know that some of the problems here is that the AI is picking and choosing what you're going to see. And what this has done is separate us into bubbles so that we find that Republicans are seeing very conservative advertisements and posts and news content. And progressives are seeing very different posts, very different advertisements and very different news contents, okay? Now, imagine what if a newspaper published something different for every person, a different copy of the newspaper for each subscriber. In a way, this is what is happening. The Pew Research Center has pointed out that one in five adults get their news primarily from social media, and only 16% regularly read newspapers or other printed sources. No two users are getting all the same, exactly the same set of stories in their newsfeed. And so as we live in these separate bubbles, we see AI separating neighbor from neighbor. And this has led to crises. Not so much here yet, although I think people are worried about the next election, but it has fueled sectarian violence in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Hungary, and Brazil, and played a major role in Britain's Brexit debacle. So this is a question. Another problem is uh, that the bias that I mentioned earlier in terms of detecting emotion also clicks in to AI. If we think about facial recognition, for example, facial recognition uh, has been fed mostly data sets of white people, so it doesn't work as well. Um, and you can see here that in particular, it does not work very well with uh, minority females. So those who are most underrepresented in Silicon Valley. A second issue that pops up is a question of agency. As we give more and more responsibility to these computers, is this taking away from the responsibility that we have? Um, and so here we have a question, not just of giving more of our functions to the computer, but the fact that as the computer code gets more and more complex, as we move into machine learning, we don't always know what that code is doing. We can't always understand what the code is doing. So here we get the quotation from Ellen Ullman in The Guardian. She's uh, a computer scientist. In some ways, we've lost agency. When programs pass into code 
and code passes into algorithms and algorithms start to create new algorithms, it gets further and further from human agency. Software is released into a code universe which no one can fully understand. Okay, so the question we then have to ask is, what is AI doing to our neighborhood? We've already seen it's separating us somewhat into separate bubbles. However, on the good side, it's connecting us. This map that is a little dim maybe in the background is a map of Facebook across the world. And you can see how connected we are, particularly in the developed part of the globe. So we can reach people who are distant. We can reach people who are shy and maybe did not want to interact face to face, but feel more comfortable interacting across the computer. And we can do these things immediately. So my neighborhood has definitely grown. Um, I have a very good friend and colleague who lives in Vladivostok, Russia. Um, we can talk as if we were neighbors right next door. Um, I'm working with a grant team in Slovenia um, on a grant on post-humanism, and we can coordinate our work together, even though we're halfway across the globe. So AI is helping to give us a bigger neighborhood. But that neighborhood is a little less personal. And so just two comments on the nature of the neighborhood. You may have heard some of this yesterday. Okay, first of all, we don't always know exactly who or what we're in contact with. And we may let the virtual get in the way of the actual and have less of a neighborly relationship with those who are close at hand. So with that, um, I'd like to end by stressing the fact that yes, the neighborhood has grown. Yes, the neighborhood has changed. But as Christians, we hold an embodied faith. The strongest thing that Christianity brings to the religious neighborhood is the incarnation, that God took on our mortal flesh, a body, the bodies that we have, in order to experience the full spectrum of joy, empathy, pain, and finally, death. And Karl Barth insists on the centrality of Jesus as the only way to grasp not only who God is, but who we ourselves are meant to be. So the incarnation is key to both Christian theology and anthropology. By taking on our suffering and mortality, God entered into a fully authentic relationship with humankind. Our bodies are necessary. They give us the deepest way to express our love for one another and our solidarity. Embodied presence, in other words, is how we are neighbors to one another. It's the best thing we have as human beings. Bart says, first and foremost, to have an authentic relationship, we need to look the other in the eye. So as we look at AI, I think we're not there yet. It doesn't have the kind of embodiment that can feel with us, that can grow with us, that can die with us. Um, we have to recognize that it has limitations. And if we overuse it, we may be putting limitations on the relationships that we have with each other on how we understand ourselves and ultimately on the relationship we have with God. So I'm gonna finish with a very old cartoon, um, but I think it, it sums all this up. And uh, a friend of mine once said, uh, we were some distance apart, that when I sent emails, that I also sometimes wrote letters from hand. And he said, they're completely different. When I get a handwritten letter from you, 
there's something in there about you, something more than I see when I read an email from you. And so sometimes I think we have to say, yeah, um, technology's moving ahead. We will move with it. We can't not move with it. But we have to remember that embodied presence that we give of ourselves to others is still the locus of our imaging God and our loving one another. Okay, and uh, that's all I have to say for now. 